be great, wouldn't it, to, to just reset, just to hit the reset button sometimes after everything we've been through for the past uh, 17, 18 months or so. Well, you know, that's what we're really going to try to do. It's not as easy as just hitting a button, but we can reset. We can get a fresh start. And, and we're going we're gonna to start this sermon series. It actually is going to track for about the next mi- nine months. And, and we're going to talk about um, all of Scripture. We're going to start next week in Genesis, and we're going to work our way through. And the thing about it is what you're going to see is, is how relevant Scripture is from beginning to to end. And I think it's going to be a fascinating journey. We're going to, we're going to invite you to, to, to study the Bible on your own every day. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Right now, I want to read this passage of Scripture because it's one of my favorites simply because it's about Jesus and it's about the fullness of who Jesus is and it is our starting point and our point of grounding really for our lives and for this whole series. So let me read from John's Gospel. Uh, this is uh, in the first chapter. And it begins in verse one. Uh, I will say this: it, it starts within the beginning, and that's and that's not coincidental to Genesis, which starts in the beginning. I think John was trying to get our attention and was trying to relate this back to the beginning of all things, at the beginning of creation. You know, Matthew's gospel it it has a genealogy that that starts Jesus, it relates Jesus all the way back to Abraham, who was the beginning of the Jewish faith and the people of Israel that God delivered. And then Luke's gospel has a genealogy that relates Jesus all the way back to Adam, the very first person. But John's gospel takes it all, it takes him all the way back to the the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, whenever that was. So it says, in the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word was with God and the word was was God. Speaking of Jesus here. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, parenthesis, that's John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning to that light. Uh, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born out of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Almighty God, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would just move among us and inspire us the same way that same Spirit inspired John the Gospel writer to write this down, would inspire us to hear, O oh God, that we find truth in this moment that can change everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so Jesus, Jesus, now John has him located back at the very beginning, 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 and And then we see Jesus in this very passage move from that to here among us. And what's what's crucial to understand about that is that God was was reestablishing his word among the people. So we have the word of God we understand is his written word, the Bible. We're going to talk about that. But we also understand uh, his written, uh, his living word, who is Jesus the Christ. um, That becomes then this standard for living. And let me give you an example. Um, this past July 4th, I had a chance to do something I've done for the last many July 4ths, and that is be a part of a, of a big fireworks show in Nashville with the Nashville Symphony. And my favorite part about that whole experience, and it never gets old, is that the dress rehearsal, uh, quote unquote, we don't shoot the fireworks for that, but they play all the music and we check our cues and make sure everything's ready to go. And, and, and it's the coolest thing. You walk in, and whether this year it was down at a 
Sand Amphitheater, usually it's in their symphony hall. And, and, and everybody's playing. And they're all playing different pieces of the music that we're going to play. And each instrument, each musician, uh, they're, they're just practicing their part or they're, or they're uh, trying to, you know, get in tune, that sort of thing. And it just sounds like a cacophony, which is a big fancy word for the word my Aunt Nella used to words, use, which was racket. It's just a racket. I mean, you know, but it's, it's glorious because it just fills the hall or even at a Send Amphitheater. It's just the sound of this orchestra and everybody's playing a different part uh, as they just get ready. And then, then the concert master, who is usually the first violinist, you know, there's a podium in front of the orchestra where the conductor stands, and the first violinist, the concert master, will get up, and she will stand there, and when she does, everybody stops. And then she will point at the oboe player. And the oboe player, and they've been doing this for years, I mean hundreds of years since there have been symphony orchestras. Point at the oboe player. The oboe has a sound that cuts through and that everyone can hear. And the oboe player plays an A, which is 440. A440, cycles per second, 440. And that is the standard that all music is based upon, certainly in, in the Western world. Eastern music is a little bit different, but in the Western world, A440, the standard tone, everything is relative to that pitch. If you have a tuner, A is 440, and that's the basis for everything. And so then the oboe player plays that note and everybody starts to tune. And whatever instrument they're playing, they tune to the same pitch. And what was a moment before to just this racket, as my Aunt Nellie would say, suddenly now is every instrument playing the same note at exactly the same pitch. And then when they're all on that standard pitch, that's when the conductor comes up and they begin the concert. And beautiful music ensues. Now, if they didn't do that, and, and, and on a much smaller scale, we do that here. We all have digital tuners up here. Um, Jason's keyboard is always in tune, but we have tuners for guitars and basses and whatever to make sure that, that we're all on the same pitch because it sounds awful if it isn't. And, you know, in the creation story, that's why God, you know, when God, when God created the first humans, he, he was there with them and, and he communed with them and they went for walks and, and he kept that, that standard pitch for how we live our life. But then the next thing you know, we're making up our own pitch. That's that thing about the apple and eating the apple and inviting evil into the world. And we decided to, to exercise our right to choose and we choose to make our own pitch. And, and when we choose to make our own pitch that deviates from God's standard, the music is no longer beautiful. And Lord knows that's true in the world that we're in today. So let's just start off before we go any further. I want to ask you a question. If you were to listen to your life, if you could just listen to your life, would you hear a beautiful symphony with every instrument, every part of your life, internal and external, everything on the same pitch, playing the same music? Or would you hear a racket? Would you hear something that sounds more like a blender running with ball bearings in it, you know, or, or a Ramones concert? And by the way, I love the Ramones, so I'm not throwing off and don't send me an email. I love the Ramones, but Ramones concerts were really loud and really out of tune. That wasn't what they were about. But you get the point. You know, which, which is it for you? And, and wouldn't we all like to be, to reset to that standard pitch? Well, there's a way that we can do that. Um, God wishes for you and me to be on that standard pitch with him. God wishes for us to be on the same page of music with him because that creates then peace and it creates this environment for life that is less chaotic, that is more focused. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome other than just hearing this grinding noise of dissonance that many us, of us here, present company included, uh, some of the time. And it's because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to choose my own pitch sometimes and I'm not standard with God. And so before Jesus, God handed down these stories. And the Bible came to us first through stories that were told around dinner tables and campfires and at different gatherings, all divinely inspired, by the way, not just random stuff that people came up with, but randomly 
I mean, I'm thinking divinely inspired notions and thoughts and dreams and visions about God that eventually became written down when people started writing. We have the law, and we have the Psalms, we have the wisdom literature, the Proverbs, and we have narratives, and we have all the poetry, we have different pieces of scripture. And all of that was done to help get us back on standard pitch. The Bible is a collection of writings that describes God's will in real life situations. Too many times we think about the Bible as being dis, you know, uh, disassociated with our modern culture. Well, the more you read, the more you realize that our modern culture, contemporary culture, is all right there thousands of years ago. It's the same issues. It's just different presenting circumstances, right? But it's the same issues from the inside out. The Bible... The Bible gives us these stories so that we can once again see how God interacted with people down through the ages and once again find that standard pitch, that A440, that will then stand out among all these competing pitches that we hear in our ears. The pages of the Bible help us get on the same page with God. How many of us ever feel like we're not on the same page with God? I'll put both hands up. You know, I sometimes just feel like as hard as I try, I'm not. And there's always a reason for that. It's always because I have lost that pitch and I'm not doing anything to go back and try to rediscover that pitch in my life. I, and I understand. And by the way, from this point forward, I will unapologetically tell you that what I'm going to try to do for the next whatever we have 20 minutes or so, 15, convince you to join us in this grow through the Bible reading plan for the next nine months. I, because, not because I'm supposed to, because I'm a preacher, not because I was taught to do that in seminary. I wasn't. Only because I know how true it is because of what's happened in my own life. I mean, I've tried to read the Bible off and on down through the years. And, you know, I would say, I'm going to read the Bible. And I would turn to Genesis and you get about three chapters in and it's like, I don't care, you know, it's just, and I would give up. It's like if you decide you want to get fit, you know, you wake up one day and go, I'm just, I'm just out of shape and I'm going to get fit. So you know what? I'm going to run. I'm just going to run. And so you put on your leather slippers or your dress shoes or whatever, and you just go out and you take off running. And you run until you probably just pass out, you know, because you, you're not in shape. But you run until your feet hurt or you just have to stop because you're so out of breath. And then you crawl back to the house and you wake up the next morning and, you, you know, you, you can't move. And it's like, okay, I just, I'm, it's not for me. I can't do that. But what if you got a trainer? You know, a trainer would come in and say, you know what, let's just go for a walk. Why don't we just go for a walk for 30 minutes? Or, you know, instead of picking up that big heavy barbell that you tried the first time you went to the gym and you picked it up and you strained and you struggled and you heard a couple of things pop on the way up and, and then the next morning you can't even pick up your toothbrush when you, and you give up. And so the trainer says, let's try a five pound dumbbell. You know, let's, let's just take this a little bit at a time. Because here's the thing, getting fit is not just about reaching a goal. It's about feeling good along the way. You should feel pretty good along the way. Yeah, you'll challenge yourself. But it's also a, really a, a very pleasant journey. And then you also gain great benefits from it down the road. Or to go back to the racket met metaphor, uh, I was in a country band once, and, and we were going to learn, some of you who are old as I am will remember, a, guy, a country artist, Conway Twitty, and he had a song called Tight Fitting Jeans, and it had this Cajun fiddle part. And I thought, you know, I could learn to play that. And I knew somebody that had a fiddle, not a violin. Believe me, I did not play the violin. I played the fiddle badly too. But, but I got it and I thought, I'm going to learn to play this. Poor Lynn, my wife, she's sitting right here. Poor Lynn. There's nothing worse than being in the same room with somebody trying to learn to play the fiddle if they don't know how. It's, it sounds horrible. It's like fingernails on the chalkboard. So, you know, I'm scratching on that thing, getting really, getting really frustrated. And, and Lynn said, you know, maybe you should buy a book. <laughs> like, oh, it's a good thought. So, so I bought this book, Beginning Mountain Fiddle. And I thought, well, that sounds, that's, that sounds like a good place to start. And the book, it didn't start with playing Sally Gooden, which was my grandpa's favorite fiddle song. 
It was, here's how you hold it. You put the thing under your chin and you get comfortable. That was the first day. And just get comfortable with having that thing under your chin like that. And then you take the bow and just pull the bow back and forth across the strings until it stops sounding like, uh, you know, two cats in the middle of the night fighting over something. And you start actually making a pleasant sound. Just do that until you can make a pleasant sound. And get comfortable with that, how that feels. And then you can start making notes. And then you can start playing songs. And I learned how to play Titan Fit and Jeans and a few other songs. And my point, you see the point. It's simple. You can't do it all at once. You have to start and do it in, in sort of bite-sized pieces, if you will. So right now then, I'm going to give you three reasons why you should join us on this Grow Through the Bible reading plan. Give you three reasons why you should join us reading the Bible. And by the way, if you decide, when you decide, let's be positive, not if you decide, when you decide to get involved in this and you miss that first day, okay, go to, de- go to the next day. You know, you don't stop. If you miss a workout, you don't stop. You just go, okay, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll pick back up on schedule and I'll work out tomorrow because I missed today. Okay, it's, it's okay. It's, there's no pressure. We're not going to quiz you. We're not going to be peeking in your window to see which chapter you're on to see if you're doing the right thing, you know. This should be something that you will enjoy. But here are three reasons why you should do it uh, in ascending order. Reason number three, because if you read the Bible, you might avoid an obstacle in the dark that could hurt you. You know, this talks about how the, Jesus was the light and he came into the world and there was darkness, but the darkness could not overcome it. There's a lot of darkness out there. But the Bible shines a light, sometimes in places you wouldn't expect. You know, uh, you, you talk, you, if you think about David, some of you know who David is, some of you don't. David was the one who wrote the Psalms. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Most of us know a little bit of that. He wrote that. He was a shepherd boy who became the king of Israel. And uh, what was it Dan Aykroyd said about John Belushi, for those old enough to remember the old Saturday Night Lives? He was a good man. But he was a bad boy, and he, he really did some bad stuff. And case in point, when he was king of Israel, he's up there walking along the palace one night. He's up on the roof. Maybe it's a hot night, catching some air. And he looks down at the village, and he sees this woman, Bathsheba. And Bathsheba's taking a bath. And he's like, dude. Well, I mean, I'm not sure he said that, but, but, but he was like, wow. So he has a servant go get her and and she she comes to him and you know he's in this position of power and and next thing you know they went to bed and the next thing you know she's going to have a baby and what makes all this even worse is that her husband is out on the front lines with the army fighting for David he's fighting for David and he's just had sex with the guy's wife and gotten her pregnant so that it gets worse So David decides, you know what? Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to bring him back in. I'm going to bring him back in and I'm going to get him drunk and I'm going to have him go to bed with his wife. And that way it's okay. It'll be, everybody will think it's his baby. Now he, this is in the Bible. You don't think the Bible's relevant? This would make a wonderful mini series. This could be on a soap opera right now. You know, I mean, really? So, so he did that. But, but, the, but her husband was such a noble person. He said, no, I'm not going to sit here and lay with my wife whenever my comrades are out there fighting on the front lines. He slept on the floor. David's like rats. So what does David do? He has him sent back out to battle. And then just as the battle gets fierce, he tells the second command, pull back. Pull back. And let him get killed. So David arranges for him to be killed. So this is King David, the man after God's own heart. Good man, bad boy, bad decisions. What if he, now I know this is a little, this is a little out of order because that was way before Jesus. But if, you, if you've ever read any of Matthew and, the, and the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has this thing and he says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't even look at somebody with lustful eyes. Why did he say that? To spoil all our fun? no. To stop that before it ever starts. What if, what if David had had access to that? What if, what if David, what if, what if you were in a position like David and you had access to that information? 
might have stopped a bunch of bad stuff from happening. And, that can ha- and it can be the same in our lives. There's all sorts of great information. And not just about sexual things, but about, but about money and about relationships and about employment, about everything that's relevant in our lives. It's in there. And if you read the Bible, you can get information that can keep you from stumbling over something. And that's number three. Number two, the second reason as we move up the scale of why you should read the Bible is because it can help you, it can teach you something. You could learn something that could really help you when you need help the most. And I'll go back to Jesus for a minute and his story of the, of the prodigal son. Some of you may be familiar with that story, but the, the bottom line is uh, here, you know, Jesus just makes his stories up. He just makes them up to make a point. But he makes his story up about this Jewish father. And, uh, and, 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 and in Jewish culture, the oldest son would get the inheritance, the, the, line, the bigger portion of the inheritance. But no son ever got inheritance but while the father was alive. So younger son, boy, I relate to this guy so much. Younger son goes to his dad and says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance now. I mean, which is really insulting. But his father said, okay, okay. So he gave him the money. And it says that he went into a distant land and spent it on riotous living. Now, you can fill in the blank on riotous living however you want to. But my guess it had something to do with buying shots for the whole bar every night until the money was gone. And he comes to himself and he's in a pig lot, which for, you know, Jewish people, pigs aren't kosher. So that's just a really bad thing. And he is trying to, he's, he has a job feeding pigs. So he's in a pig lot and he's wishing that he could just eat the pig food. He's starving. And he thinks, you know what? I'm going to go back home. I'm going to die here. So he goes back home to his father. He's thinking, maybe my dad will just let me be a servant. I can never be his son again. So so the dad, meanwhile, you know, he's out in the street. He's looking. He's looking for his boy. And he sees his son coming down the road. And the father, not walks, runs to him throws his arms around his son smelling literally like pig manure which is really bad anyway but for a Jewish family really pig manure and his father throws his arms around him and he hugs him and says oh we're gonna have a party my son's home now if you didn't know that and you were like me and you would live part of your life where you wound up sometimes smelling like a pig manure you know, you just, you just lived a life that just made you feel icky in your own skin. You made so many bad decisions. See, for much of my life, and I've, I've, told, I've shared this before, I assumed that God could never love me because of mistakes I had made. And then I read the Bible. And I realized that God could love me. I learned about the cross. And that can change everything for you. But you would never know that because that's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to think that the God of the universe, who is perfectly holy and sinless and perfect, could ever have anything to do with the likes of me and you. (laughs) But read the book. He loves you. And he'll give you chance after chance to come home. You wouldn't know that if you didn't read the Bible. Number one. Number one reason to read the Bible Jesus. Jesus is there from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus once told the the religious professionals, and I hate it, those are the only people he ever got mad at were the preachers, you know, and and believe me, I live with that all the time. But he was like, you guys, you want to quote scripture to me? I'm I'm in all these scriptures and you're missing it. I'm in the whole thing. I think it was in Luke's gospel that he said, I didn't come to do away with the law, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, which is all there was at that time. I didn't come to do away with with it. I came to fulfill it. Every comma, semicolon, and exclamation point, jot and tittle in the the Hebrew. He's He's in the whole thing. And so when you read the Bible, you get this incredible vision this more fleshed out vision of who Jesus and his great love is and what it can mean to you. Here's the bottom line. Jesus is the perfect description of the word of God 
seen in its entirety in real time. When we read about Jesus, we're seeing the length and breadth and height and depth of Scripture. It's him. So as a way to kind of bring that home, kind of seal that deal, I want us to sing a little song together. Everybody knows this song. And, uh, and, and, and I just want to, want to let the words settle in because sometimes you break, have to break it down to something really simple. So here we go. Sing with me. Jesus loves me this I... Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, let's not sing it like that. Come on, on I'll be the conductor. We're going to sing this thing. Let's sing it. We're going to sing it. Ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Stop. Really? Did you hear what you just sang? Jesus loves me, this I know. Got that. Jesus loves me. How do you know? Our little kids know. They sing that song all the time. How do you know Jesus loves you? Because the Bible tells you so. How are you going to know if you don't read the Bible? You going to trust me? <laughs> you want to you trust me? Well, hopefully. But you shouldn't just trust me or Will or Pastor Brooke. Pastor Mike, or anybody else, any of the other teachers. So, so I can hear you saying, I can hear somebody saying, well, yeah, but Larry, I've read John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Got it. End of report. Why do I need to read any more? I got the whole deal. Well, here's why you should read more. Did you ever hear the story about Jedediah and Elsie? Jedediah and Elsie. Older couple, lived on a farm. Jedediah was a very stoic, very, a very firm, stern, stoic man. And they'd been married 50 years. And on their day of their 50th wedding anniversary, what are they doing? They're weeding in the garden because that's what Jedediah wanted to do. So they're out there weeding in the garden and Elsie looks at him and finally she just throws down her hoe and she says, Jedediah! You never tell me you love me anymore. And he looked at her and he said, Elsie, 50 years ago today, I told you I loved you. If that ever changes, you'll be the first to know. (laughs) Well, okay, okay, I get the point. But that's not the way you nurture a relationship. There's got to be more to it than that. You need to hear it more than once, amen? You need to hear it every day, maybe multiple times a day. The people that you love the most, why do you love them the most? Probably because you're with them the most. You talk to them the most. You know the most about them. If you love somebody, if you love somebody, and you just go, man, I just love this person. I, I love you. I love you so much. But I won't be talking to you again for a while. See you. That's not the way you nurture relationships. That's not the way you grow. No, you want to spend time with them. You want to learn everything about them. And the same is true with God. And Jesus, what Jesus has done, Jesus has come to strike that perfect A440, that perfect pitch again. So that then we can have that in our lives to relate everything to. I know, I've known a few people in my life that have perfect pitch that can just out of thin air, they can hum an A or a C or whatever. I can't do that. I have relative pitch. Most people can do that. If I know what one note is, I can tell you what another one is by just walking it up or down the scale. I don't have perfect pitch. Most of us don't, but we have relative pitch, and that's what this is all about. Jesus gives us the standard, and then we relate to that. We relate our life to that, and we make the adjustments we need to make relative to that perfect pitch. Who wouldn't rather have harmony than discord in their life? God has made that possible for us through his written word and his living word, who is Jesus the Christ. So, uh, I think I think they're on your little connect uh, your little connection cards right now. We're going to ask you to actually sign up to join us, and it's not because we're going to 
call you, you know, and hey, how you doing? You're keeping up, aren't you? No, it, it's just sometimes when you write something down, it's easier to make a commitment to it. And I'm asking, I'm not, and I'm serious. <laughs> We're serious about this. We really are. We want everybody reading the Bible with us. And it's just going to be a, a manageable amount every day. <laughs> and what our kids are studying, the sermon series that we're doing in here and in the sanctuary, all of our teaching <laughs> will be related to those scriptures so that we're just going to be immersed with this focus on this passage and that passage and what we can learn from it. And it's going to be wonderful. And I'm just praying that you'll take part because it's going to transform you. I promise you that. I've been there. I'm still in process. And it'll also transform our church. So I'm going to ask the band to come up and, and uh, we're just going to sing a little bit of that, <laughs> of that last song we did, The Word of God. I love that song. We'll sing it a little slower. Uh, but I want, you to, I, want you to, I want to get these words in front of us again about the Word of God and the difference it can make in our life. Uh, it's all about seeing God as he relates to other people in the same situations we're in, you know, we don't ride camels and we don't live in, you know, in tents in the desert and, and we don't eat, you know, mostly bread and maybe the occasional pomegranate and a, and a minnow or something. You know, we, we live our life differently now, but the struggles and all are the same. So 